Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. The views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Hey everyone, today we're going to hear from Ro Nania, who is joining to share her family's story with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and her own story of advocacy after her brother Angelo passed away due to an aortic dissection caused by VEDS. If you like this show and want to help our communities raise awareness of these conditions, consider joining my Patreon. This show wouldn't be possible without the support of my subscribers there, so if you're already supporting the show, thank you. And remember, you can always support the show just by sharing it. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Ro, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast to share you and your family story with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I think a lot of people in the community know you already, but I would love for you to introduce yourself for those who don't. Sure. My name is Rosemary Nania, also known as Ro to everywhere else. And we've been part of this Feds family for a good five years now. Actually, we're going on seven years that we're in the family. So it's been great having you part of the community and knowing you. How did VEDS kind of come into your family? Like, when did you find out about that and how did that happen? So VEDS became evident late 2017. September of 2017, I was headed to the city. I work in Manhattan. And I got a text message from one of Angelo's friends. Angelo's my brother. And... He said, hey, don't mean to drop this on you, but your brother's in the hospital. He doesn't really want people to know. So I'm friendly with this person that texted me. And I said, I'm on my way. So Angelo happened to pass out at work overnight. He was working an overnight shift at Madison Square Garden. He was an electrician. And he had a couple of aneurysms rupture on him. We knew that by the morning, by the time I got that message. So we got into Mount Sinai. And I looked at him and I said, what the heck, bro? And he said, I have no idea. But I'm feeling like I'm reliving daddy a minute, which is another story. So after a few hospitalizations from September of 2017 through December, December is when he got diagnosed with VEDS officially. So did he know about those aneurysms before they ruptured? He did not. And then they found, do you know which... um out of curiosity, it, do you know which arteries? It was they were? in his stomach area. So I'm not 100% okay. sure which arteries, but it was down in the lower stomach area. And you said he said he was reliving daddy, is that what you said? Yes, because my father in 1995 went into the hospital. And a week later, after doctor misdiagnosis and surgeries, and my father wound up passing after 10 days, and he went in with an aneurysm in his knee. And then one in his stomach, and they tried to do procedures on him, and they were trying to do a bypass to get the leg circulation back for my dad. And um, the doctor came out of the surgery and kept saying, his veins are all falling apart. We don't, we don't really know what's happening. And we thought the man was drunk. Literally was, what, what do you mean? Now, yeah. 29 years later, I know exactly what that means. But um, at the time, at the age of 20, I was stumped. So... It was very reminiscent, all of the things, the chaos that happened overnight, him being in the hospital, to that morning that I guess it brought back my father's week in the hospital for him, which is why he made that comment. Yeah. How old was your dad when he passed? My dad was 51, just short of 52. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do any investigation at the time into why the veins were fragile? So his cause of death on his death certificate is a pulmonary embolism, but leading up to it, No, I mean, it was 10 days in the hospital. We didn't, from start to finish. It was just a lot. (laughs) It was an intense 10 days. Yeah, it sounds like it, for sure. So Angelo, they did do an investigation then at that point for Angelo while he was going through those hospitalizations in 2017. With Angelo in 2017, they started with, let's figure out what is happening because this is pretty rare and unusual. And then they found he had a few more aneurysms that were intact. 
that they wanted to go back in and put some coils in. They also brought him in for another procedure to insert something. I think it was called onyx, and it was a tar-like substance to fill his aneurysm so that they wouldn't rupture. But then they started asking us questions. All of us were in the room one day. Uh, my oldest brother, Angelo, John, and me and my mom were in the room. And the doctor came in and said, we'd like to ask you some questions for about Ehlers-Danlos. Can we do this within the family or should I ask them to leave? And he said, no, they're full siblings. Go for it. And so she ran over a list. I want to say, I'm going to guess 10 questions. And she said, you know, all of you mentally just answer yes or no in your head and we'll talk about it after. And say it was 15. I remember saying, I have eight of those. And my brother said, oh, I maybe have five. And John said, maybe he has four. And I joked and said, move over. Clearly, I'm the sick one. Like, get off the bed. Then they ran the test for him to see if he had beds. And he came back positive for beds. And what did that, what did that feel like? So when we first got the test results, I looked it up on Google. And I quickly shut the computer. And I said, that is awful. I don't want to know anything about it. And I did that a lot the first month that he was diagnosed. And then it had a note on there that said first line relatives should be tested. And I tried to contact a geneticist and my insurance denied me because it wasn't a standard test. So I kind of just let it go. Um, 2018, there was a lot of denial not only with myself, but with a lot of the family, we just didn't talk about it. I think back now, I don't know if it was better or worse for Angelo that it was kind of a a subject that it was taboo. If we don't talk about it, it won't happen. And I don't know if that helped or hurt. And I guess I'll never know that. (laughs) But um, I sometimes feel bad that he didn't get to express fear or because whenever he would bring it up and he wasn't really joking, I guess, but he would say stuff like, well, if, you know, I die. If I if I hit 50, it'll be a good thing. And everyone would be like, oh my God, don't say that. Which I think is a normal reaction for us. And that makes us feel better not to talk about it. But I don't know that it helped him. So I do know after his death, my insurance covered it. <laughs> so go figure. Ugh. But 2018 was a good year of denial. And um I, I want to say that probably collectively as a family, that was the, we don't, we just, we'll keep the elephant in the room and just not think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So then when did he pass away and what happened? So it brings us to 2019. You know, again, we were early in the year doing the denial thing, but Angelo's life had progressed. He was getting divorced. He had been separated a long time. He was getting engaged. He bought a house. And fast forward to Father's Day, June 16th of 2019, my family does this whole Belmont thing, stakes, and we go to the horse races. A lot of us do. We were getting ready. Angelo was not coming this year because he had just moved in his house two weeks before. His daughters were there, and he we were going to go after the races to his house. I was texted him at about 9.30 in the morning. You know, happy Father's Day. See you later. Didn't think much of it when he didn't respond. And got my mom. We went and got gas. And as I was filling up the car, I saw my niece calling his daughter, Dana. And I heard through my mom's phone the panic in her voice that my brother had passed out and EMS was working on him and he wasn't coherent. And so we pivoted (laughs) for the day and I called up my cousin who arranges this outing and said, I don't really know what I'm walking into, but we're not coming. I'm headed towards the hospital and uh, I'll keep you posted. And I got on the highway for reference. The hospital they were taking him to is about 40 minutes from my house. I believe I made it in 23 minutes. So I don't really remember the drive so much. I just knew I flew, but we had called back and my niece said, well, they're taking him. He still hasn't woken up. And I heard my brother's voice go, it's my exit row. And I kind of shook that thought out. And I was trying to talk to my mom in the car because at the time, I guess she's 77 now. So she was 72. And she said, no, he'll be okay. It's my anniversary with daddy. He'll be fine. And then that crushed me a little bit. By the time we got to the hospital, 
I parked and we were getting out and I went to call my niece and say, hey, where are you? And she gave me the news that he was already gone. I don't think he ever made it to the hospital. That is what we've been told at this point. But you need a doctor to pronounce you dead in New York anyway. So that was a hard day. (laughs) And I laugh because when I'm nervous, I tell jokes. But um, it was hard overall because when I had gotten there, like there was a lot of things happening at the hospital. Like his fiance was unconsolable. And that's like a standard thing. His kids were, they were young. They're 20 and 23 at the time going through this. And um, I remember talking to the doctor and saying, well, he has beds and giving him his history. And the guy was kind of shocked. Like he's a young guy. There's no health issues. And aside from beds, he really didn't have any health issues. Fast forward a little. I had asked for the coroner to do an autopsy. And in Nassau County, they, because I told them he had beds, they just were assuming it was beds. And I know I argued so hard and I was irrational on the phone with the coroner. And I was like, how do you know he wasn't poisoned? He just had his first father's day. And I did not think that his fiance poisoned him. But I literally was like, how do you know he wasn't murdered? Like, (laughs) and again, (laughs) I do not think she did that or his kids or anyone. But like, you're so frantic, like. I need an answer. And honestly, it goes back to my father's death for me at the age of 20. I didn't have any answers. And my family does a lot of hypotheticals. Well, it was probably this and it was probably that. And so I had lived all those years at that point with this shred of, well, maybe I needed an answer for this. I, yeah. I fought so hard because I wanted to be like, no, he died because of Ed's. He died because of this. I didn't want it to be all these other rumors. And um, I wound up getting the autopsy done and it was confirmed that it was beds. So, yeah, that was And he had had an aortic dissection? Yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry that you lost your brother and your father to this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My father was never diagnosed, but it's definitely, I mean, now that we have other people in the family with it, it is definitely known that it's probably that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi- highly suspected. Probable. Yeah. But in 1995, no one knew what that was. So. Right. Yeah. What were some signs that maybe Angelo had when he was growing up that were missed? So I don't know if it was missed, but there were Angelo, John and myself were the top three. Like there's a big age difference between James and Louise and I. So I'll speak for the top three because we grew up only we're 22 months apart. Um, We were all very clumsy. Every single one of us. I can fall standing up straight. My brother Angelo has broken both of his, both of his Achilles tendons ruptured as did my dad's. John caught footballs and fell and broke both of his wrists. We, were injured a lot. And we just thought we were a very clumsy family. And we kept saying clumsiness is in our DNA, which is so many other Veds people's fights and stories. And now looking back, I think knowing what I know now, if I saw this in somebody else, I would be, hey, maybe we need to have a conversation. But growing up, I just was like, I accepted the fact that we had clumsy DNA. And I guess we do. (laughs) So... Yeah, I hear that a lot from people with beds. Yeah, but I mean, there were a lot of hospitalizations. I mean, Angelo fell off of a bicycle in his 30s, flipped over the bike, and his shoulder went in his back. He had another time where his finger dislocated. I mean, all the bones broken, all the cuts and the injuries, and it's, you know, now (laughs) it all makes sense. Back then, I was like, what the hell, man? So Yeah. And then you think about how many people are walking around not knowing about this, too. Correct. Correct. You said earlier that after Angelo died, your insurance company did um, authorize a genetic test for you. So after his death, I had that summer, because he died in June, that summer I had called around to make appointments and we were trying to get my siblings and I appointments with a geneticist, but in the tri-state area, there's... I was told at the time in 2019, there was maybe 12 geneticists. So it was very hard to get an appointment. So we got an appointment for my birthday of 2020. So January 24th is when we, three of us went to go get our genetic testing. I have four siblings, but three of us went. 
And um, it was easier to do this, the appointment together because you have more of a family history, who remembers one thing, who doesn't, and then the doctor doesn't have to guess. At that point, because my brother had passed, they were okay taking my insurance for it. So it, it always amazes me that that happened. Or I would have probably went and got tested in 2017 when he did. So then in, 20, in January 2020, we went and got tested. I would say it was about three or four weeks later, I had gotten a phone call with my results that I did not have it. And one of my siblings at the time that took the test with me tested positive for it and hid that from us for a little bit, which I think he was just trying to process it himself. But, um, you know, there's really no hiding it now with me. So, <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> become very involved. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. I know my family hates me at times for bringing so much light to something that they would rather sleep on. But I know deep down they appreciate the work that I'm doing. Or so I have to believe. <laughs> but they, they get on board. I mean, I know I'm very bossy, but they get on board. <laughs> I do not think it would be their choice. And to be fair, if Angela yeah. was the only person in my family diagnosed, I still think I would have sought out the VEDS movement because I came to you, be I, I had spoken to you personally before I even got diagnosed because I was having a hard time coping. And it was later in 2019, and that's when the VEDS movement had spun off and you were working there at the time. So, um, yeah, I think I would have still been involved, but I don't know that I would have went the extent that I've now become. Now yeah. it's personal. Yes. So let's talk about that some more. Yeah. I know you, you've done a lot since your you know, brother's yes. passing and, you know, multiple family members and everything. Mm -hmm. So tell us what you've done. So in 2020, the world shut down with COVID. 2021, I decided I'm going to do a fundraiser and raise money. And everyone was so supportive with the walk for the walk for victory that Marthan does that I wanted to do something back for them because I said, you know, if they're giving me 50, 75, a hundred bucks, can we, uh, I want to do something back. So I wound up doing a comedy event the first year and this will be my third one coming up, but it went so well that, you know, my cousin jokingly said to me, my cousin Phil said, you really should, you know, start a foundation with this. And I was like, there's no way <laughs> that's not happening. And uh, three years later, I am one. I celebrated my one year anniversary of our nonprofit, which is Beloved's and Nania Foundation, which is a cue to both my dad and my brother, whose names were Angelo. And uh, yeah, we're we're, go we're going full force. So we're starting our third fundraiser, which will be this April in 2024. We launched a scholarship for kids in the VEDS community, but they don't necessarily need to have the diagnosis because someone like myself and a few of my nieces and nephews wouldn't qualify for the few that are out there. So we wanted something because we know it affects the whole family that we wanted to give back to just the community in itself. So that's what we started doing. So the kids don't know yet that they've gotten the scholarships, but they probably will by the time this airs. I'm excited to start giving back to the real people at this point. Like I know I will always fund the organizations that are doing the testing and it's, it's just now part of my DNA, but I also need to give back to the community at this point for my own benefit <laughs> because yeah, how could you just not do anything at this point? I just, I don't know. Ask me next year what I'm going to be doing and I'll, I have no idea. This is surprising me as I go along too. <laughs> I love that. How did you, is the uh, comedy event, are those like public events that you can, anybody can register for or are they kind of private? They are public events. And this year it's funny because when we were planning it, I said, I want new people. I want, I love, I love my core group. I love them. But the more that merrier and my core group, I'll know about it. So we have 36 new individuals coming this year, which it, it holds 160 people. As of today, I'm at 130, so we have two months left to go, so I know I'm going to sell out. But 36 of those are brand new, spanking new, which is that's really amazing. nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. I need a bigger so place next year, So the scholarships are announced. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. It'll be a huge comedy event. So the scholarships, when are those announced? April 8th, we're going to announce those. 
which is Angelo's birthday, funny enough. So, Oh, yeah, I love that. It's all in divine timing. <laughs> it is. Um, when is the comedy event? April 27th. So if somebody listening wants to attend that event, where do they sign up for it? So they could either find us on Facebook at Beloveds and Annie Foundation, or they can go to our website, which is BelovedsFoundation.org or even NannyaFoundation.org now. We uh, just got that web domain. Awesome. So, yeah. I will uh, put that in the episode description Thank as you. well. So if you're listening to this and looking for it, you don't have to pause it and rewind or anything like that. It'll be yeah. down in the in the description of the episode. So for you, mm-hmm. with this diagnosis in the family, you become very involved like as a person who loves your family. Mm-hmm with this condition and you become very involved in the community. What has that been like for you? Just like the, the vet's diagnosis overall, the involvement in the community, you know, meeting other people with it. What has that been like for you? So it's definitely kept my therapist employed. Um, It is a blessing and a curse. I guess that's fair enough to say family is fierce for me with or without the condition and it has always been and to know that now I have this whole extended beds family is uh, they're like cousins to me like they are extended family members it is heartbreaking it is encouraging it is all the good and bad wrapped into one and then I dump it on my therapist <laughs> <laughs> and we sought out feelings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you have other family members that have been diagnosed. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you mentioned earlier how many family members have been diagnosed. Since so Angela's. right now we have four. So I have a brother with it and I have three nieces with it. What is something that you want medical professionals to take away from your story or know about vets? I think my biggest wish for the medical profession is that they actually understood what this is. The most terrifying, frustrating thing for anyone with VEDS in their family is the fact that it's still such an unknown. (laughs) And I'll talk to my general practitioner and I'll say VEDS and he thinks I'm talking about VETS. Now, I'll give you some leeway because I have a Brooklyn accent and maybe the T is a D or the D is a T. But when I say it's vascular Ehlers-Danlos, they immediately drop the vascular part. And they're like, oh, Ehlers-Danlos is so common. It's really not. And I'm like, but it's not. (laughs) It's not that one. So I think my biggest wish for all of the medical profession is to actually know what that is. And I think by just saying the words beds and vascular Ehlers-Danlos and everybody just keeping it at their tip of their tongue will help with that. But I think that is my biggest wish in this community. Yeah, the knowledge. Yeah. And then if somebody else uh, was in your shoes or had been through something that you've been through Mm -hmm. or is going through something that you've been through, what kind of advice would you want to give them? I would say surround yourself with the right people. Find your crew that you can actually have a conversation with. Seek the professional help. Talk to a professional. What you're feeling is real. And it should not be invalidated because you, you're making someone else feel uncomfortable talking about it. I'm a big proponent for mental health. That's great advice. Thanks. Yeah. I, um, I'd love it if we could end this interview with some of your favorite things about Angelo and your dad and maybe any of your other family members who have VEDS. Okay. So I guess maybe I'll do their personalities. My dad was funny, witty, very handy, could build you a house if you gave him the right tools. Dramatic. I think the dramatic side comes from when, I, when, I ha- when I'm a little dramatic. I think that's definitely from my dad's side. And just, he loved family too. Like he was a fierce family lover. For Angelo, Angelo was two different people growing up and later in life. Growing up, he was... 
very flirtatious and he was like all the girls loved him. He was a little bit of a jerk, if I had to really be honest, uh, when he was younger with people. And uh, <laughs> when he got older, he got into holistic practice and meditation and kind of changed who he was as a person. And he was very involved, but didn't make it very known that he was very involved. But it helped him with some of his anger. I think it helped process some of the VED stuff, if I have to be really honest, and it probably helped him transition to the other side when his time came without fear. But he too was super handy, super, I mean, he's another one who, he was an electrician by trade, but he could build the craziest things in the house. And I don't have that talent. I can't even really draw all that well. So the fact that they both possess those, you know, but they were both very lovable, likable, I'm sure they piss some people off, but um, <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> but That's they part of the human experience. Exactly. Right? <laughs> they definitely left their mark. I think they, to sum both of them up, I think they were unforgettable. I think they left such a mark in the lives that they touched that their legacy will live on forever. It will be shown in their grandchildren. It would be shown... I mean, I look at some of my nieces and nephews and I see my dad in them, which is crazy. But I also know that someday I'm going to see that in my brother's grandchildren. So it, it's like a good thing too. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your family's story with us and your own story of advocacy and getting involved. And I just really appreciate everything that you do. I appreciate you giving me the platform to tell my story finally. <laughs> So thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode featuring Ro Nania sharing her family's story with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I've put a link in the show notes for the links to the comedy show and the website for Beloved to Nania Foundation. If you're ready to meet others, get involved, or need support, there are more links for you there too. There are several events coming up soon in different areas across the country, so be sure to check it out. I know quite a few people are heading to Portland, Oregon for the symposium on May 11th, and of course, Reds for Reds Day is also right around the corner in May. There's also a link in the episode show notes for the VEDS Collaborative Natural History Study, a research study led by Dr. Shireen Shalhoub, open to people with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and similar connective tissue conditions. If you like this show, be sure to share it on social media or give it a rating or review. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon. As always, my top tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Next week, we'll talk to Betsy Margarita, who is joining to share her story with Marfan syndrome. See you soon.